Hello YouTube, RJ. Hey, when I left you last, we were working on trying to figure out what in tarnations was going on with this Colpitz oscillator that I had the very strange issue with. We were trying to test this Colpitz and a Franklin against each other for stability, but this Colpitz just wouldn't behave itself. Uh, it would run for about 16 minutes and it would slowly lose amplitude until it just fell off to the point that the frequency counter or nothing could even detect it. And so we took a look at the potential of maybe it was not enough gain in the oscillator stage and the amplifier of the oscillator. And I ruled that out. I increased the gain substantially and it didn't solve the problem. At the end of the last video, I told you I was going to scratch my head, going to work on it. I have to split this into a two part video. So here we are in part two. And let me tell you what I've done. I went ahead and hooked up the oscilloscope and had a fascinating bit of information returned to me. What I've got here on the bench is I've got channel one hooked up to the actual output of the buffer. I've got channel two hooked up to the output of the first stage, the actual oscillator output into the buffer. So you're just looking at the signal as it just prior to it going through the coupling capacitor into the load stage or buffer stage, I should say. So that's the output before it goes through the buffer. So we've got the, the channel one, the yellow trace of the oscilloscope will be the actual output of the whole system after the buffer. Channel two, the IN will be just the amplifier oscillator stage itself's output into the buffer. And then channel three, I've got hooked to the nine volt regulator output just to watch our nine volts, make sure our voltage is, is looking good. I'm going to jump over to the computer where I can do a voiceover of a recording I've already done of the oscilloscope tracking this for a while. And I'll speed it up and I'll show you the interesting outcome that I found. Okay, let's take a review of what we're looking at here on the screen. If you look at the oscilloscope, you see the yellow trace. That's the normal output on channel one coming out of the um, whole circuit, what we've been watching all along. If you look at the cyan trace, that is the actual output prior to the buffer stage. That's just the amplifier oscillator stage, the first stage. That's what's going out of it that would go into the buffer. If you look on the screen, you'll see a purple trace that's flat. That's your 5 volt uh, voltage supply off of the regulator. You can see it's clean, no noise, very stable. And if you take a close look, you notice two white tra uh, two white cursors, one at the very top that touches the peak of the yellow traces at the top of the scope. That's showing us where the output is currently, so that we can just look at that and see a reference of where we started and where we are as we go along. If you go down to near the bottom of the screen, you'll see a dashed cursor that just touches the cyan waveform of the first stage output of the oscillator. And so this will let us just look on the screen and reference. We can watch the waveforms if they've changed their amplitude. So now what I'm going to do is, because this takes quite a while, I'm going to go ahead and go into high-speed time lapse and let you watch what I saw over, oh, I don't know, 30 minutes. So uh, here we go. Okay, did you pick up on that? What was strange about it? Well, just in case you didn't, the output from the first stage, our oscillator itself into the buffer stage, did not move at all during any of that. We saw what we've been seeing, where the output of the, the complete circuit is dropping off in amplitude. But the output from the first stage into the buffer stage never changed. The 9 volts never wavered. That's kind of odd. Think of it this way. You've got a buffer stage, you know, low gain amplifier, not designed to amplify a lot, just there to, to you know, deal with impedance and keep from loading the first stage down, getting the same signal the whole time, but it's dropping off. Why would that happen? The voltage isn't going down. So I say, maybe I need to check and make sure the 12 volt supply isn't dropping off. I'm feeding it from the lab supply. 
no reason it would, but uh, let me do that real quick. Let me run a, a test where I look and see if the 12 volt, because if we look, let me pull the schematic up, show you schematic. If you look at the second stage, notice it's not fed through the 9 volt regulator. It's fed through the 12 volt that's feeding the 9 volt regulator. So my power supply is regulating that. Let me verify the power is not changing on the 12 volts real quick. Then from there, we can go on to what it might be. I'm, I'm starting to wonder if I've got a bad transistor. Maybe, maybe the JFET is bad on the buffer stage, but you would not expect the buffer stage to change output if the input to it is not changing. The, you know, the biasing, the resistors aren't changing. What, what would be changing that would cause that other than maybe a, a transistor that's got a problem? Let me check the 12 volt, come back and let you know what I found there, and I'll, uh, I'll, we'll go from there. Okay, same setup we had last time, except now the purple trace is the 10 volt input off my main power supply feeding the circuit, not the, the 5 volt after the 5 volt regulator. So I'm going to kick it in high speed and let's see if that voltage drops any. Okay, well. As you can see, that didn't solve our issue. The 10 volt feed stayed rock steady, still had the reduction in the output of the buffer side of the oscillator, but the oscillator stage one, again, didn't move. So, you know, think about it this way. I'm reading right here where the red arrow is. I'm picking up here. I've got a, a coupling capacitor here. I've got a 150K resistor to ground. I've got the JFET. I've got a 1K resistor. I've got a 0.1 capacitor for my output coupling capacitor and I'm coming in with plus 12 I'm running plus 10 but plus 12 in through a 22 ohm resistor and a 0.1 microfarad capacitor for filtering so I've got a little bit of a you know filter here none of this would change none of this would change over time I just don't see if the signal here is the same it there's no reason the signal here would change over time this stuff wouldn't change over time. Neither of these filters would change over time. The only thing I can see is that this JFET has got a problem. And as RF's running through it, it's internally warming up and, and changing. So at this point, you know, the troubleshooting is pointing to this J310. So let me change it out with a new J310 and we'll try it and we'll see if we get any differences. So that'll take me a few minutes. Let me do that and we'll give it another run. All right, I changed the second stage JFET out, and here we go. Well, obviously that was the issue. We had a bad JFET. That was a brand new JFET from Mauser. So, you know, the old adage, just because it's new doesn't mean it's good. What can I say? Put the new JFET in, works perfect. No other changes needed. We're ready to, uh, let this thing cool down, get to room temperature, uh, may even wait till in the morning, pop it in the test cell, run it for two hours, and find out how stable this thing is. And then we can compare that to the information we've picked up on the others. Now, some of you may be wondering why I chose the title of Never Trust Schematics for this series of videos. And it was because when I ran into problems in the first video with this, it brought to mind something I wanted to mention, that is never trust schematics. What do I mean by that? Well, it's happened to me. I know it's happened to lots of people. And it can be an issue that stops people from the hobby. And that is, you pick a schematic out of a magazine or out of a book and you build it and you can't get it working. And so you assume it's just you, but I want you to know it's not. It's happened to me so many times I can't count. And people I know that are in the hobby of electronics, they've run into the same thing. I've even heard designers who put articles, designed a circuit and put it into, wrote an article and had it put into a magazine talking about the issues they run into. Part of what they say is sometimes there's transposition issues with what they send the magazine and what they put in and things uh get messed up and so the translation doesn't come out exactly the way the person that designed the circuit intended it to be that can be a problem sometimes it's just the wrong version of the circuit the finish they think they submitted the finished version of the circuit but they actually sent a schematic of the circuit before they got it working well 
Um, other things is sometimes people build a circuit, do a schematic of it, and don't realize that part of their circuitry is very sensitive to a value. And so you know, we all know that if you buy a 5% resistor, you've got a range it can operate in. And if they happen to get a resistor on one side and you happen to have a resistor on the other side, that can one resistor could cause you a problem. The reason I'm bringing this up is I want you to know if you're in this hobby or you're getting into this hobby, understand that it's not you if you build a circuit that doesn't work. It's where, you know, if, if you go over and you don't find a mistake, it could be you. But if you're really sure you've got everything right, it might not be you. And I kind of started thinking maybe there was an issue with this circuit. Now, this circuit came out of experimental methods for radio frequency designs. And that's a very well vetted book by some really good guys that wrote it. So I kind of expected this to be a good circuit and it appears to be a good circuit. It's just we, we happen to be unlucky enough to get one bad part. But anyway, you got to see how I went through trying to troubleshoot and figure out what was going on. You know, very quickly with oscilloscope, after assuming it was a gain issue, which is common with, you know, oscillators, once I put the oscilloscope on there and started looking at the different stages, we quickly could eliminate the first stage and move into the second stage. And there's not much to that second stage, as you saw. It's pretty straightforward. Very little there. So, you know, we uh, kind of quickly could zoom in on the active part. So anyway, let me go ahead, let this cool down, get it set up to run the test again. I'll run the test, let you watch it time lapsed, and then I'll throw that data into our spreadsheet and we'll take a look. Now, in the meanwhile, I went ahead and ran the Franklin. So I've got that data. I can, I've got the video of, of that run I can put in. So I'll go ahead and I'll run this one first, show you how it did, put it in the spreadsheet, and then I'll show you the Franklin, what the run on the Franklin looked like. We'll throw that in the spreadsheet and compare everything. And we can come to a conclusion which design of these two oscillators would be better for me to start off with. Then I can take and take that oscillator and I can tweak and try to perfect that oscillator to be as stable as it can be with fixed capacitors. We'll then and only then we'll move over to putting some variactors on it and uh, put our, our system on and see if we can tune the oscillator. And then if we set it on a frequency, you know, how much instability did we get from the variactors being added in? So I'll get this run running. We'll see how we come out on this oscillator. Well, with those two runs completed, we've got all the data we need to compare these two oscillators. So let's jump on Excel now and take a look at how they turned out. Okay, here we are on Excel. We're looking at the G3UUR that we showed in the last video. Crystal oscillator, very stable. A little bit of startup, not too bad, only like 23 hertz jump there. So let's take a look at our culpits. Here's what our culpits looks like. Starts out pretty flat and then starts to fall in frequency and falls continuously all the way through the run. We can see that it drifted over two hours, 597 hertz. The second hour, it drifted 417 of those hertz for a average rate of about 6.956 or almost seven hertz a minute, which is not great. Normally a good oscillator, five hertz a minute. So a little over that, not bad. I mean, not bad really, but not as good as some of them you will see, and that's their five hertz per minute rate is with a tuning capacitor hooked to it. And we, we, we have fixed capacitors, so not horrible, not great. Let's look at the Franklin. Well, first thing we notice is the Franklin kind of climbs a little bit on us here and then starts downwards. So it's not quite as stable at startup. So let's take a look at the numbers though. Uh, drifted over two hours, 281 hertz, so quite a bit less. The second hour drift was 186 hertz, and the second hour rate was 3.1037333. I should have rounded that off probably, but one thing to note is that the coal pits saw 0.3C for temperature change. The Franklin saw 0.4, so it 
saw a little bit more temperature change in the chamber. That's not bad. So what I did is I took the two and I compared them. The problem was they run at different, slightly different frequencies. So what I did is I normalized them by taking the higher and lower frequencies at the very start, calculated the difference, and applied it to all the frequencies of the Franklin to bring it down to match the cold fit starting frequency. And that way we could move the curves close together so that the chart wouldn't scale out in such a way that we couldn't see the differences. So here's what we've got. So the curves haven't changed at all. All you've done is brought them into close proximity so that we have enough resolution on our scale to be able to really see what these comparatively look like. This curve would have been up higher in frequency than this is all that would have been different. And you can see that when you look at the Franklin on startup, it doesn't appear to be as stable to start, but not for a long period of time we're talking here and then you know you're talking 15 minutes or so and then it and then it becomes more stable you drift lower as you go but at a much less rate than the coal pits we look down here i did a little math here's the different here's how much total drift from startup to the two hour mark on both of them and this is the drift rate for the whole two hours you can see it's dramatically lower for the franklin uh, with 2.34813 hertz per minute, which is a very good rate. The coal pits for the whole two hours was 4.97715. Again, not horrible. But when you really take the math and look at it, the Franklin was 63% less drifty. I'm leaning to the, the Franklin at this point. I think the Franklin is probably the, the oscillator to take from this point and move forward with this project. But hey, you know, I'd love some uh, I'd love some feedback. You guys want to get in the comments and tell me why you think that's a good idea or a bad idea? Uh, I'd love to hear from you. So anyway, we went through a lot of twists and turns to get here, but we finally got to the end of what we originally wanted to do in the first video, and that is compare these two oscillators and see how stable they were compared to each other. Neither one of them comes close to a crystal oscillator, that's for sure, but this gets us a starting point. Hey, thanks for hanging out for this two-part solution. And hey, if you haven't subscribed, do me a favor, hit the subscribe button. And if you like the video, slam that like. Hope to see you in the next video.